very happy to announce, in fact, Margrethe Vestager, uh, the executive vice president of the European Commission and the commissioner for competition, our commissioner uh, here in the room. Margrethe, you're most welcome. Um, you start your speech now, and then Cani Fernandez, our colleague from the Spanish Competition Agency, will take my place here and will um, moderate Margrethe for some questions and answers. And again, I will give, I will give the stage directions. Um, so, Margrethe, you have the floor. Well, good morning, uh, and thank you very much. It was, uh, I think, obvious that it's better to be in person and not having these kind of technical issues. And I was really looking forward uh, to seeing you in Berlin today. Uh, obviously, planning to be with you in person. But we're kicking off the legislative process here in Strasbourg on an important file regulating uh, foreign subsidies uh, if disturbing the competition within the union. And that, for sure, would be the topic on many future discussions of the ICM. Even if only virtually, it's a great honor to be able to address the ICM today more than 20 years since its creation. As an organization, we have, oh yes, certainly grown from just 14 members in 2001 to 140 today. But our strength is more than just our numbers. This network is a success because it provides a model for the kind of international cooperation we need in the 21st century. Today, the world economy is multipolar, facing challenges as, and crises never seen before. The horrific events in Ukraine, I think they show how high the stakes can be. They're the most forceful reminder that successful cooperation depends on respecting our diversity on working to build consensus, encouraging best practice. New challenges in international competition policy. Of course, well, we all see them. Nothing ever stands still. And as our economies need to adapt both to the long-term transformation and unprecedented shocks as we live them, well, we have to change. Green transition remains the foremost challenge of our time. There are many ongoing discussions on the right balance between regulation and competition to promote it. But my focus today will be on the digital transition and how we should tackle it together, given the pace of change that we're all experiencing. When markets move fast, cooperation across borders become more necessary than ever. And the good news is we see this happening already. And a good example for antitrust is our work with the CMA, where we just jointly open investigations on Facebook's use of advertising data and on the Google Facebook open bidding agreement, the Jedi Blue. But our experiences in these cases, and in many cases we handled within the European Union, has also made us sensitive to the limitations of traditional enforcement instruments. As competition enforces, we have seen a number of digital cases explode around the globe. It's even hard to keep track. This illustrates the global and systemic nature of the practices and the market features we have seen in digital platforms. And it also illustrates why new tools are necessary to keep up. Some are calling it the great pivot to digital regulation. Actually, I don't like this term very much. I think it creates a, a false sense that the regulatory approach for digital is completely novel, something that we have never seen before in the world of competition policy. And that's not the case. Ex ante regulation has always been complementary to antitrust enforcement and merger control. Just think about telecommunications, energy, financial services. And we got guidance from the courts recently confirming this complementarity in the B post uh, judgment. In this judgment, the court held that regulation and competition enforcement can work together because they pursue complementarity and connected, but nevertheless distinct legitimate objectives. 
And this is what we expect for the future of digital markets too. A hybrid approach in with both ex ante regulation and traditional competition tools will play their part. At the same time, it is true that digital markets have some unique features. The role played by data is in some ways unique because it allows for zero pricing models and it allows conglomerates to jet propel their reach using consumer data as their fuel. Digital markets also display, extreme, display, display extreme network effects. We have many markets in which just a handful of companies control access to end users and take advantage of that access. Of course, this is a developing story. With the Digital Markets Act, the Commission might be slightly ahead for now, but we are all heading in the same direction. Already, other major jurisdictions are adopting digital regulation. South Korea recently adopted legislation on, on app stores. Other jurisdictions are considering new digital uh, regulation. And here in Europe, Germany adopted its own digital regulation last year. The speed at which the debate has shifted from whether there are antitrust cases at all to full-blown regulation is quite extraordinary. The global agreement on the issues raised by large digital platforms is also extraordinary. This debate is no longer a hot topic amongst competition practitioners, but it has strong political attention and things are moving fast. We reached a political agreement on the Digital Markets Act just a few weeks ago. The architecture of uh, the DMA is designed around central enforcement at EU level with designated gatekeeper subjects to certain do's and don'ts. This makes sense because we're dealing with only a limited number of companies which are defined active with, by definition, active on a European scale. The DMA will enter into force next spring and we are getting ready for enforcement as soon as the first notifications come in. The next chapter is exciting. It means a lot of concrete preparation. It's about setting up new structures within the Commission pooling resources from GG Comp and Connect based on relevant experience. It's about hiring staff. It's about preparing the IT systems. It's about drafting further legal text and procedures or notification forms. Our teams are currently busy with all these preparations and we're aiming to come forward with the new structures very soon. For that next chapter, close cooperation with competition authorities both inside and outside the European Union will be crucial. This is irrespective of whether they apply traditional enforcement tools or had developed their own specific regulatory instruments like in the German digital regulation. The close cooperation will be necessary because we will not be short of work and we will not be short of novel services or practices to look at. And the efforts needed at a global scale, they are enormous. So we need to work together more than ever. And we already do. Part of the preparatory work for the DMA will involve discussing with national competition authorities our future cooperation within the DMA, as well as coordination between the DMA and existing national regulations. My bet is that many of you will be watching the rollout of the DMA with great interest. This will be a mutual learning experience. The European Union has worked hard to find the right balance. And I think we have come up with something that is tough, but also very fair. It goes without saying that the more we, as an international competition community, are able to harmonize our approach, the less opportunity there will be for global tech giants to exploit enforcement gaps between our jurisdictions. It's worth remembering that the reverse is also true. The more we work together to develop common approaches to these challenges, the easier it will be for the tech industry to ensure compliance. And compliance is, after all, 
what we ultimately strive to obtain. In this sense, good international cooperation can only be a win for enforcers, for businesses, and ultimately for consumers. That doesn't mean that we all must have to adopt the same set of laws, and that's not going to happen. We all have different legal systems and traditions. We have different priorities. The European Union has shown time, time and again, sometimes differences can be strengths as long as we're united in our diversity. What is important, I think, is that we have a common understanding of the principles that we're working to defend and a willingness to talk and to listen. If we do, we learn from each other. After all, that is what the ICN has always been, a space for us to engage in the right kind of dialogue. And that is why the, today's discussions are so important. The themes chosen for the sessions could not be more relevant and the timing could not be better. Before I conclude, I remind myself that when the ICN was created in October 2001, it was exactly 45 days since the horrific attacks of September 11th. The brutality of those events cast a shadow over our work. It left a stain on our vision for a peaceful, cooperative world. But it did not stop us. New York City built back. And we continue to work together towards a better future. Well, today, it's exactly 73 days since Vladimir Putin ordered the invasion of Ukraine, shattering the peace in Europe and casting another shadow over what we do. But this will not stop us either. Ukraine will build back too, and the world will continue on the path of peaceful cooperation. Through the ICN, through other forums, we will work even harder as an international community to achieve that brighter, more prosperous future. Because ultimately, competition policy is about more than just prices, barriers to entry, or market share. It's about the prosperity and the welfare that comes with it. It's about openness, and it's about freedom. Thank you very much. And many thanks, uh, Margrethe, for your, uh, well, encouraging, forward-looking, and inspiring words. Kani Fernandez has now entered the stage. Uh, she's, ready, uh, she's ready to moderate, and uh, I hand over to Kani. And we still see you perfectly and hear you. <laughs> Good morning, Executive Vice President Vestager. Um, some weeks ago, as you were mentioning, a landmark record political agreement was reached as regards the Digital Markets Act. From previous texts, we can see some elements of how the DMA enforcement by the Commission will interact with the national competition authorities in Europe. There is a well-established cooperation and coordination between the NCAs and DigiComp as regard traditional 101 and 102 enforcement. How do you think this cooperation will work as regards this new instrument within Europe? And which interactions with other authorities around the world can we expect? Well, good morning, Kani. It's, uh, I cannot see that it's great to see you because I don't see you, but it's, it's great to hear your voice. Um, what, what we are preparing for is a seamless cooperation because uh, what we have experienced over so many years of the European Competition Network is that we are so much better when we work together. Uh, the Digital Markets Act has a, a, a structure. Um, it's built on sort of a single market logic, so it's a harmonizing structure with uh, the Commission being uh, the decision maker. But it's thought of in a way to make us as strong as possible. And, uh, and this is why um, the national competition authorities, they are, uh, the, you know, the cooperators, uh, the eyes and ears um, on ground uh, for the uh, commission. First, uh, complaints can be uh, uh, logged 
uh, reported to the National Competition Authority. Uh, second, uh, the National Competition Authorities can uh, investigate uh, questions of non-compliance uh, by platforms of the uh, do's and don'ts, uh, the obligations, the prohibitions, uh, in order to, to assist the Commission in order for us to, to make this work uh, together. So, I think this is, uh, this is really important uh, because the enforcement actions by the Commission and the National Competition Authority, uh, of course, should remain fully uh, coordinated, should remain consistent. Uh, and second, uh, we will uh, be able to rely on, on the resources and obviously the expertise of the National Competition Authorities. Uh, I, help, I, I think that is crucial for effective enforcement uh, by the Commission uh, of the DMA. Uh, the European Competition Network, uh, of course, will play a crucial role here. There will be a high-level group of relevant bodies and, and networks, uh, including uh, the European Competition Network in a uh, consultative uh, role. <coughs> and when it comes to, to enforcement in itself, the Commission will be assisted by a digital advisory uh, committee with, uh, with member state representation. And, and there is uh, another element, and that is the question of, of mergers, because uh, the Digital Markets Act will impose an obligation on gatekeepers to inform the Commission of all acquisitions in the digital sector, uh, any acquisition that enables uh, collection of data. Uh, and this information will be shared uh, with national competition authorities in order to make sure that we, in the best possible way, uh, can, um, uh, can get the work done. So um, uh, it will improve our ability uh, to track uh, acquisitions that might be problematic uh, for competition looking forward. Um, within the Commission, uh, as we speak, uh, GG Comp uh, and GG Connect uh, will be working on DMA uh, enforcement. Uh, now we are in the process of, of sorting out the exact uh, structure. Uh, as said, the joint team are in the process of setting up um, uh, sort of the follow-on uh, work uh, from the legislation in itself on procedures, on forms, uh, how to notify uh, that you might uh, have to be designated a, a gatekeeper. Uh, so specifying all these details. And, uh, and here, the Digital Markets uh, Advisory uh, Committee uh, is part of this structure and also needs to be in place uh, before we get started. So, so going forward, uh, I think it's really important that we share experiences. Uh, I hope that we can also uh, share staff, uh, that we can use the continents with uh, one another in order for uh, knowledge to travel with people. Uh, I, I, I love what we can do online. I love what we can do with, with Q and A's, with, uh, with notices, with non-papers, but real experience, real knowledge uh, that travels with people. Uh, so I hope that, uh, that we can do that too. Uh, and I say this because one of the things that I have learned over these, wor these, wor these years is that we can do a lot but we can only be successful if we work together uh, in these uh, really, really challenges issue, challenging issues. Thank you very much. Um, let's go to a different subject. Let, let's go to merger control. Some argue that merger control has not kept at, uh, at up with developments in digital markets, which has led to under enforcement with uh, Facebook, Instagram, Facebook, WhatsApp, or Google double click being examples of them uh, quoted. Do you see a gap in uh, merger control enforcement? Uh, and what changes, if, if any, could be introduced to address this concern? In Spain, for instance, uh, we have, in addition to the turnover threshold, uh, a market share criterion for merger notification. Some countries have introduced a transaction value criterion. What is your view in this debate? And uh, related to this, is the Communication Commission guidance on the application of the referral mechanism uh, set out in Article 22 of the merger regulation part of the solution to this puzzle? I, I think this is, uh, these are key issues. 
uh, that you, you, you talk about uh, here. Um, because uh, even despite the pandemic, uh, while well, 2001 was a record high in, uh, in uh, volumes uh, in mergers and acquisitions, and uh, digital uh, mergers, they were no exception to this trend. So this is not a detail, this is, this is a core uh, issue. Uh, and two things I, I think it's important to discuss and consider. Uh, one is jurisdiction, um, who is doing what, how do we get to see and review uh, these mergers uh, as they take place. Uh, and the second, uh, obviously a substantive one, uh, what are the theories of harm? Uh, what are we looking at? How do we assess uh, these mergers? Uh, on the first point, uh, on the jurisdiction, uh, we in involved you uh, a couple of years ago. We had a very close look uh, at our merger threshold to make sure that we capture uh, high value uh, deals involving ter targets with uh, with no or, or very minimal uh, turnover, uh, as some of them are. And uh, such deals, well, they are often uh, not caught by the EU uh, turnover-based uh, thresholds. Uh, when they are caught by uh, national uh, thresholds, um, well, they can be referred to us based on, on the traditional uh, Article uh, 22 mechanism. Uh, this is what we saw in the Meta uh, customer uh, deal, uh, a deal that uh, Austria referred to us. Uh, and we are, as you know, developing uh, the use uh, of Article 22 uh, for also uh, member states uh, referring uh, cases to us that do not meet uh, national thresholds. Um, and I do think that this is an important uh, part of the puzzle of how to get to see uh, the relevant mergers. Uh, because it gives us, uh, a, um, I think, a very flexible way of uh, working together. It prevents a tsunami of, uh, of notifications. Uh, and it allows us to look at uh, what, we have, what might be uh, really crucial uh, when it comes to, to competition and, and what concerns one could have had. Uh, so it's, uh, it was a long yes to the last part of your question. Is, uh, is the way of using Article 22 an important part of the puzzle? Uh, yes, it is indeed, uh, as to how to get to review the mergers. Uh, on the second part, uh, on substance, uh, this is an ongoing debate. Um, I don't think we are uh, ready to, to fully conclude uh, on that yet. Um, there are different sides, uh, and I think it's important to discuss really carefully. Uh, on our side, sort of on also putting some, you know, uh, cases uh, into the discussion, we have, uh, we have seen a development from cases basically being cleared in phase one uh, with no further ado to the situation that we have now uh, where uh, we have, uh, you know, really detailed uh, investigations of phase two. Uh, where we end up uh, only uh, clearing a merger with uh, intrusive, or not intrusive, but, but with remedies that would solve competition concerns. Um, we have uh, now tested uh, different kinds of remedy for the uh, Microsoft LinkedIn, it would be interoperability. For the uh, Meta customer, it would be an access uh, remedy. And for the Google Fitbits, uh, it would be a di data silo uh, remedy. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there has been a, a shift. Uh, and the next, next shift will come with the Digital Markets Act. Uh, because here, uh, we will have um, a completely different level of information about what is uh, ongoing. Uh, and also, we will have that the uh, do's and don'ts will give obligations, for instance, when it comes to interoperability or the, the use of data. And that is a massive shift uh, in the way that uh, gatekeepers um, operate. Uh, so I think that will have to be taken into account uh, also in our merger assessment. Uh, and the DMA, uh, of course, uh, also gives us the possibility to impose a ban uh, of uh, mergers if there is a case of systemic uh, non-compliance. Uh, I said I, 
I am not at all myself ready to, to make uh, strong conclusions uh, in this debate on, on substance. Um, I really appreciate the, the reflections uh, that are taking place, uh, that be in the US uh, of colleagues there, that be in Germany, that be in, in South Korea. Uh, I'm really happy uh, to take uh, part in it. Uh, and of course, uh, more than happy to continue the discussion. Uh, I think it's important uh, that everyone comes to the table with the experiences that we have from looking into these mergers. So, so this is a really welcome discussion. Well, thank you very much, Executive Vice President. Um, it has been a pleasure uh, interacting with you and uh, thank you so much from everybody here. Well, thank you very much. Have a very, very nice day.